Good morning. You know, uh, I grew up uh, in Manhattan, um, in New York, and uh, actually lived in Queens um, uh, as a little boy. And the first school I ever attended uh, there um, was called the Academy of St. Peter Claver. And it was in the Bed-Stuy or the Bedford-Stuyvent neighborhood in Bronx, in the Bronx. And I really loved uh, as a kid when February rolled around because it was during Black History Month uh, that we learned about people like Benjamin Banneker, Ida B. Wells, George Washington, Carver, Marian Anderson, Langston Hughes, Ralph Bunch. And I think what I loved about it the most was that it was history. And I really enjoy uh, history and learning about different things. And, um, and this history was kind of cool because a lot of the people that we were learning about looked like, looked like me. And I thought that was great. And this month, um, as uh, we, uh, as our nation observes uh, the Black history, I want to take time this week, next week, uh, to address a couple of things that have a really strong connection uh, to this month. And this week, I want to take a look at a topic um, that um, Dr. Martin Luther King saw kind of as a, it was a gospel anchored key uh, to societal transformation. And next week, um, we'll have Eric Owaskowitz here, and he's actually going to uh, bring a word from our own Free Methodists away, um, and he's going to talk about love-driven justice, and that'll be awesome. Looking forward to that um, next week. Here is the truth, though. Here's a fact. We live in a nation that you could say exalts our worships, at the altar of unrealistic notions of needing no one else. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Um, there uh, is a, um, there's a very familiar ringtone that you, some of you may have heard, some of you may not have heard it, but it sounds a little bit like this. Let me see if I can get this. Does that sound familiar to anybody? No? Yes? If you think you know what that is, raise your hand. It's a ringtone, but it comes from a particular program. You know what it is? What? 24. The show 24. That's exactly right. It's a great, uh, it's a great ringtone. If I could just get it to stop, because it's annoying. But the show is 24. That's the name of the show. And... Uh, I'll admit it was a guilty, it's a very guilty pleasure of mine to watch 24. Um, if you're familiar with the show at all, you would have observed that there's a main character. Anybody remember the main character's name? Oh yeah, so some of you watch this guilty pleasure too, right? Jack Bauer, and Jack Bauer worked for who? Do you remember? He worked for the CTU, the counter terrorism unit, right? And Jack Bauer, time and time again, if you watch the program, all the pressure, all the responsibility, all the duty is all on his shoulders alone. Time and time again, Jack Bauer would be out in the field all alone. His work as a counterterrorism agent regularly placed him in the position of being the only one who could do the job. The only one. As a matter of fact, Jack didn't have a partner. He didn't have a backup. Nor did he have anyone that was really close to him. As a matter of fact, there was a running theme in the show. If you remember this, there was a running theme that anytime Jack had a partner, someone who got close to him, what would usually happen? Do you remember? They'd get hurt. Something really Something awful. What typically happened to people who got close to Jack? It was that kind of relationship, that kind of connection to Jack Bauer would cause you to lose your life. And you know, I think we as a nation sometimes carry that same sort of thing around as a people. We kind of this, we have to be by ourselves. We have to do it all alone. Not all the time. But that's, a, that's kind of a mindset. And it's one that communicates to our friends, our neighbors, 
folks around the world, sometimes we kind of come across saying, we don't care what other people think. We don't care if you help us or not. We don't care if you agree with us or not. We're going to take care of this issue, whatever the issue is, all by ourselves. Now, here's a, here's a fact. The truth is, really, no one gets there alone. And today I want to encourage us to examine a particular teaching about this particular issue. Dr. King spoke about the power of community, the, the difference that he insisted on being my brother's keeper can make. As a matter of fact, Dr. King called this beloved community. And I just want to scratch kind of the surface of his thoughts on beloved community. And I just want to examine a few principles that came from him, but also that are grounded in what we find Scripture teaching us and telling us about what it means to live in community, what it means to live in beloved community. So here's what I want to do. Let's, let's pray together first before we go any further. Let's pray. God, we know that when we look in your word, you've made it very clear. God, you call us to live in community. God, you looked at your creation and you noticed something right away when it came to your creation of us, of humans, you noticed that there was an issue. We needed community. We needed to be with others. And so, God, as we take a look at this topic today and we look at it through the lens of powerful teachings, a powerful example in the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., God, we pray that we would be encouraged. We would, uh, we would take advantage of the opportunity to find ways to live in community, in beloved community with one another, being our brother and sister's keeper in order that there might be flourishing, not just in this life, but in preparation for the life to come. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Dr. King's talking about trying to get us to think about this issue of beloved, beloved community. Here's principle number one that I just kind of pulled from what some of the things that he said, but also some things that I think really come to us from Scripture. We were created to live in community. Here's a great, I love this, I love this quote uh, from Dr. King. He said this, we're tied together in the single garment of destiny. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We need each other. We were created for one another. There's a book um, called The People's Religion. Have you ever heard of, have you ever heard of the name George Gallup? Does that sound Gallup, you know, Gallup polls? He, he wrote a book called The People's Religion. And this is what he said. He said, Americans, you and I are among the loneliest people in the world, which when you think about it, seems a little bit bizarre. I mean, we live in neighborhoods that are teeming with people. We drive on pretty congested freeways. I mean, I've noticed the freeways here in Detroit. They're just as congested as anywhere else, right? So we've got all these people around us. We sit right next to people like you are right now. Yeah, there was once upon a time we didn't sit right next to people. And if we did, we had a mask. I mean, the whole nine years. But we, we are around. We are with people quite a bit. But there's still this loneliness, pervasive loneliness. There's an American photographer by the name of Eric Pickersgill, and he came up with this project. And uh, I want you to take a look at several pictures. Uh, kind of keep this to yourself, but tell me what you think you're seeing, what, something you notice as you look at these pictures. What did you notice about those pictures? What did, you, what did you see? What were they doing? What? But they were with, with others, even while they had the device in their hand, right? That project is done by a guy. He named it Removed. <laughs> it's a photo project that he did. It's called Removed. And here's how another magazine describes those images. In each portrait, 
Electronic devices have been edited out so that people are staring at their hands. The empty space between their hands, often ignoring beautiful surroundings or opportunities for human connection, right? The results are kind of sad and it kind of looks a little, I mean, it is kind of weird, kind of, kind of creepy, funny even. But it's also a really good reminder, right? Sometimes you, you just have to put your phone away. We have to figure this out, folks. We have to figure this out. Even in the face of this proliferation of various devices that compete for our attention, how do we connect with others in community? Because that's what we're made for. Think of it this way. The book of Genesis in the Bible gives us this account of creation of the earth, the moon, the sun, the stars, plant life, animals. And at the, each, at the end of each of those efforts and accomplishments in creation, God concludes with three words. Does anybody remember what those three words were? It is good, right? Then on the sixth day, on the sixth day of creation, fashioning of humanity in the image of God, creating from the dust of the earth, Adam giving Adam a place to live, a job to do, food to eat, and one singular rule to obey. God changes up the conclusion he's been coming to about the work of his own hands over the last days because something isn't right. Something is missing. We read in that passage that we saw this morning, the Lord said, it is not good. For the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. God said it is not good for the man to be alone. And see, coming back to something that Dr. King talked about regarding calling people to beloved community. And this echoes that comes to us from the book of Genesis. There is a book called The Search for a Beloved Community. Actually, it focuses on the thinking of Dr. Martin Luther King. And in that book, the vision that Dr. King lays out is a vision of a completely integrated society, a community of love and of justice, where brotherhood would be an actuality in all of social life. And with this in mind, a community would be the ideal expression of the Christian faith. That's what beloved community is. And Dr. King affirmed that principle that we as human beings are dependent upon one another. We need each other. But we have to understand, we have to understand, this does smack in the face of our culture. You know, I don't know that I have to remind anybody, but I'm telling you, being with other people during the pandemic, that was tough. It was hard to pull off. Lots of loneliness. People isolated. Some of it, had to happen because people were sick. Some of it, we just, it just happened and we, we, we isolated ourselves. And no, you know, I think even people like, I'm an introvert, right? But even during the pandemic, I was like, man, I love you family, but I sure would like to see some other people, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's a real thing, right? Because we're, we're made to be with, with other people. That's, that's, that's how we're wired. But there's another principle. There's another principle that Dr. King spoke of, embodied this key principle of this beloved community. And this is it. Community number, principle number two is that community, community can change the world. Can change the world. And Dr. King was centered on justice. That was a, that was a significant part of what he uh, called for, what he was a, a, a drum major for. But he said this. He said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yeah. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The denial of just the rights of being a human, being threatened, when you do that, you, you, you violate the rights of all humans. And Dr. Dr. King's vision of, of justice, of community, it included, it was, it was a, a wide vision, you know. It included the world's 
poor people, including people who were black, people who were white, people who were brown, North Americans, South Americans, Africans, Asians, Europeans. Economic justice was something that he held was the right of all humans. I love this, I love this saying. Justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. You know, here's the difference, though. Dr. King, while he preached this, he had a different approach to achieving it. It was really, it was really quite different. You, you may, this may sound kind of familiar to you. He, he believed that this beloved community should come as a result of a different way of resisting um, the causes of economic and racial inequity. See, Dr. King believed that uh, this old age tradition of hating your opponents, it wasn't only immoral, but it was a bad strategy because it perpetuated the cycle of revenge, retaliation. And he said this, only nonviolence, he believed, had the power to break that cycle of, of get you back violence, you know, and create lasting peace through reconciliation. If you, you know, you talk about Dr. King, if you read about him, you find out that a lot of these things, you know, this particular approach was based on some things, many things that he had read uh, from Mohandas Gandhi. But even more specifically and more directly to the point, it's the life of Jesus that proclaims that nonviolence in community changed the world. That's what Jesus taught as well. This is how we change the world. We don't resist. We don't come back with a strike. As a matter of fact, Jesus said to turn the other cheek. When someone wants to give you trouble, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I want to share with you kind of this radical vision, this radical vision for community that changes everything. I mean, actually, it changed the world thousands of years ago, and it changes the world now. I just want to share a, someone who wrote about that. This is were the words that were written. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, Insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free, mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. These are the words of the Apostle Paul from his letter to the Colossians, in chapter 3, verse 11. These are the words that really are meant in part to usher in this beloved community that Dr. King gave his life for. And so to achieve this beloved community ideal, one of the things that's really important to remember, we as humans are created for community. We see that in Scripture. Community can change the world. <laughs> we see that from the lives of so many who came to Christ in the, in the Bible. Here's the third thing. Here's the third thing that's, True beyond a shadow of a doubt. Community will last forever. Community will last forever. One of the speeches that I really, really love, that I find myself coming back to, comes from April 3rd, 1968. And it was actually the night before Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And he spoke of the promised land. Spoke of the promised land. And, and this is what he said. He said, you know, it's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder and all of its symbolism. And, but ultimately, Dr. King said, people want some suits. They want dresses and shoes down here. And he said, it's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey. But God commanded that we should be concerned about the slums here children who can't eat three square meals. He said, it's all right to talk about the New Jerusalem. But one day, 
God's preacher, people like me, we need to talk about the new uh, New York, the new Atlanta, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, the new Memphis. This is what we have been called to do. Then he closed the sermon with words that I'm sure many of us have heard. He said, well, I don't know what's going to happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't really matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind, like, like anybody, I would like a lit to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. He says, I'm, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And he said, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. And I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And even though he knew the possibility existed, that he might not see this beloved kingdom, this beloved community come into existence, he knew it would come. Again, just a, another good quote about this idea of beloved community. Dr. King, he worked unceasingly for the realization of this dream. He never lost hope that there would be a great camp meeting in the promised land. His hope was rooted in faith, in the power of God to achieve his purpose among humankind within history. You know, at the close of the reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is famously known as what's, it's famously known as the love chapter, right? In verses 12 and 13, I want you to listen. I want you to listen, read along with me. Well, Paul writes these words. He says, for now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. He says, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I want to read that in just a slightly different version. Now, all we can see of God, it's like a cloudy picture in a mirror. Later, we will see him face to face. We don't know everything, but then we will just as God completely understands us. For now, there are faith, hope, and love. But of these three, the greatest is love. Think about this. In that day, in that day when we see God's face, we will no longer have a need for faith. In that day when we see God's face, face. There will no longer be a need for hope. The only thing that will last into eternity is love. And what does love require? Well, it requires an object of that affection. It requires a connection. Huh. Love requires community. Because of this, community will last forever. Let me, let, me close with, let me close with this thought. I believe that Dr. King firmly believed that this life on earth, it's really a preparation for the life to come. However, if we could not learn how to live in harmony here, if we could not learn how to take up the cause of the, the outcast, the downtrodden here, if we did not intercede for the poor, the destitute here, if we could not stand up for justice here, it's going to be very difficult. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge to stand in eternity before God and sing to the Lamb of God with a single bit of honesty, credibility. The words of the Apostle John from the book of Revelation. 
we read these words, you are worthy because you were killed. And with your own blood, you bought for God people from every tribe, language, nation, race. So I want to leave you with this challenge in light of what we've been talking about, this vision from Dr. King about this beloved community, a community that's strengthened by family, a community that's based in faith, and a community that eagerly anticipates the future. We too must not grow weary in straining for the goal, that, that high calling, the prize to become that beloved community. And the great thing about it is we get to practice what that could look like right here and right now. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful that you have entrusted us with the treasure of the good news of Jesus. And with that treasure, there's a responsibility. And Father, May we lean into that responsibility, not on our own strength, but rather because we know you empower us through the presence, the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we be people who embrace your call to live in community, that we would be people who recognize this is what we were created for, we are called to, to live together, to, to be engaging, walking through this life together. God, that's a high calling. It's a lot of work. But God, that's why we lean on you. That's why we depend on you. That's why we ask you to empower us. We are, we are so, so grateful that you love us that much. You love all of us that much. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.